Hello and welcome class to chapter three, Professional Ethics, Legal and Regulatory Issues Lecture. As you know, the difference between law and ethics is basically the topic of law and ethics and bioethics are all interrelation and difficult to discuss without referring to one another. As we know, laws are societal rules or regulations that are advisable or obligatory to observe. Laws protect the welfare and safety of society, reserve conflict in an orderly and non-violent manner, and consistently evolved in accordance with an increasingly polarized society. Whereas ethics refers to the moral standards of behavior or conduct governed by an individual's actions. Their moral standards are developed throughout their life, beginning with the childhood learning process of differentiating between right and wrong. All healthcare providers are confronted daily with professional choices, choosing one type of needle instead of another, and using and use of cleaning agent that creates an allergic reaction in a patient. Choosing a patient or a procedure that can be harmful and can impact not only the patient but themselves as well. When a healthcare provider makes an error, he or she must try to remedy that error and learn from it as well. The healthcare worker must be knowledgeable and recognize that what can be harmful to a patient and try to avoid what is wrong at all costs to the patient itself. But when referring to bioethics, bioethics refers to life itself, which refers to a moral issue or problem that can result because of modern medicine clinical research and are technical. Unlike, usually bioethics refers to the life and death situations that occur, such as abortion, when a patient should be allowed to die, who receives the organ donation, life and death decisions that has to be made. Ethic checks. <clears throat> Basically with ethics, and as far as with healthcare workers, we are faced with all kinds of ethical decisions at one time or another. As healthcare situations become more complex, ethical decision making requires using a healthcare team approach as well as an individual approach, meaning you have to go by what you know as being right and wrong. The simple set of questions that follow can serve as an ethic check per se, for people facing an ethical dilemma or decision. To evaluate a difficult situation, simply ask yourself, is this legal and does it comply with inter institutional policy? Does it foster a win-win situation with the patient, supervisor, or other individuals? How would I feel about myself if I read about this decision in the newspaper? How would my family feel about said situation? Can I live with myself after making this decision? And is this decision the correct and right decision? Patients' rights. As we know, all members of the healthcare must always recognize that the first responsibility is, of course, to the patient's health, their safety, and their personal dignity. So patients do have rights. And to institute those patients' rights, we always follow the American Hospital Association, or the AHA, which recognize rights for patients in healthcare organization. The AHA originally adapted the Patients' Bill of Rights back in 1973 with, sorry, um, with the latest rev revision in 2003, which is titled the Patients Care Partnership, 
which is the key elements which involves a patient's rights to the following. They have the right to have quality health care, and they did add a little more to it also. As you know, we have a big problem in America. Not everybody has health care insurance. So even if they don't have health care insurance and it's an emergency situation, and they may not send them to charity hospital and they go to a private paid hospital. And when we say private paid hospital, that simply means someone who has insurance and can afford to pay um, the insurance bill for whatever the insurance itself doesn't pay in rendition. So everybody receives the right to have quality care, no matter if they have insurance or not, if transported to a hospital. They are entitled to have a clean healthcare environment. They are also have um, patients' roles in his and her healthcare, meaning if they sign a DNR, you have to respect that DNR, meaning do not resuscitate at all. <clears throat> um, privacy rights. They have the right to have privacy, which is true. And they also have um, another key patient's right is availability of assistance when leaving the hospital or the billing issue. Sometimes if a patient cannot afford their hospital bill, there is um, fellowships or such that are designed to help patients to pay for their um, hospital bill. And as far as leaving the hospital, that's why every patient, no matter if you can walk on your own two feet, are always wheelchaired out of the hospital, no matter what. Another part of patients' rights is the National Patient Safety Goals, or the NPSGs. This is formed by Joint Commission and an independent non-government, which is an independent non-government agency that provides standards for the objective evaluation process that guides healthcare facilities to measure, assess, and improve in performance for patient care and safety. To be accredited through the Joint Commission, a healthcare institution must undergo an on-site evaluation by a survey team every three years and two years for the clinical laboratory. Today, this regulatory agent has developed into an international authority. The Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals are established to help healthcare organizations address specific areas of concern with regards to patient safety in healthcare facilities for the clinical laboratory the 2012 NPSGs are to identify patients correctly. We are responsible for identifying patients correctly, meaning that we do not stick unless we verify that we are in the right patient's room, sticking the right patient, and that we verified said patient correctly. Improve staff communication, meaning provide test results to the right person in a timely manner. So whoever the ordering physician is who wants said test, we have to make sure we result those tests out to the doctor at a timely basis when he needs it in order to treat the patient effectively. And we always, always try to prevent infection by simple hand hygiene. If you can't get to soap and water, always carry a little handy, a uh, little tube of um, hand solution on you at all times until you can get to a sink where you can actually wash your hands for 20 seconds. As you know, governmental laws are broken down into two branches. You have your legislative branch and you have your executive branch. In your legislative in your legislators blah, 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 in your legislative branch, written laws are called statutes and are made at the federal, state, and 
county levels. In Louisiana, it's the federal, state, and parish levels because we have parishes, not counties. And as far as the executive branch, they make executive uh, administrative laws. Then you have your judicial branch, which hears and establish case laws based on legal cases from lower level judicial branches, meaning if a parish judge rules this way and they appeal, it goes to state court and if state court gives a certain judge and they appeal, they can go to federal court and get heard for the same case to see if the same ruling still stands or does a new ruling be made according to what the defense wants to hear. Basic law principles are the laws governing medical, medicine and medical ethics components are overlapped each other. This has changed, however, healthcare consumers and patients have become more aware, more critical, and much more willing to sue. Their middle name becomes sue. Anyone that their lawyer believes has, has been at fault, including healthcare workers who are collecting blood specimens, meaning you as a phlebotomist can be part of a lawsuit if the patient so deems that you've done them wrong. Because their middle name is sue. Happy. Legal terminology. Here we go. Negligence is a violation of duty to exercise reasonable skill and care in performing a task that you have been certified to perform. That is negligence, meaning you do not perform your job to the best of your abilities that you have been trained to do. Um, the following factors must be considered in an alleged ne negligent cases. Duty. Duty relates to the duties or responsibilities the hospital or healthcare provider has towards the patient. It also includes all the individuals who had a duty towards the patient to use the appropriate standard of care. We always have to use the appropriate standard of care. Breach of duty which relates to whether the duty was breached and if the breach was avoidable. The plaintiff must be able to show that actually happened and that the defendant acted unreasonably, meaning we breached our duty to comply with the patients. Foreseeability relates to the concept that certain events may reasonably be expected to cause specific, not Atlantic, results for example, using a long, large needle to collect blood from an elderly patient with frail, brain, frail veins will foreseeably lead to vein damage and accumulation of blood in the skin around the venal puncture, meaning causing a hematoma. You foresaw this because you used a bigger needle, so you did it anyway, so you did a negligence of duty because you didn't do your duty. Approximate causation relates to whether the breach of duty actually contributed to or caused injury. Also cons concerns all the parties involved in contributing to the alleged injury. There must be a direct line from the conduct, conduct to the injury. Injury or harm. This is a demonstration that an actual physical injury occurred. As an example, as a healthcare worker collected blood from a patient, the needle went through the vein into the medium nerve and the patient subsequently lost the use of three fingers of his hand due to the nerve damage. Damages is the actual injury and the amount of money rewarded to the plaintiff, which is the injured client, 
that is based on compensating for the resulting injuries, pain, suffering, and permanent disability it was caused. Mm -hmm. I also want you to be familiar with Box 3.2, all of the legal terminology that you will come into play with. Make sure you understand what assault is, what battery is, what breach of duty means, what civil law, criminal action, what's a defendant, false imprisonment, felony, fraud, invasion of privacy, liability, litigation process, malice, malpractice, misdemeanor, misrepresentation, negligence, what, who is a plaintiff, res idius lugora, don't speak Latin, that's how it says, respondent superior, um, and subpoena, and what is a part. So malpractice, basically malpractice or legal negligence is defined as improper or unskilled care of a patient by a member of the healthcare team or any professional misconduct or unreasonable lack of skill. A breach of standard on the part of the healthcare worker collecting blood for laboratory essay could place both the physician and the healthcare worker at risk. This is a cause for some malpractice. HIPAA, which basically means Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, H I P A A. HIPAA is a law that is created for legal requirements for the protection, security, and appropriate sharing of a patient's personal health information. The information is referred to as the Protected Health Information, or PHI. HIPAA requires that healthcare providers obtain a patient's written consent before disclosing medical information for the routine use of diagnosis, treatment, payment, or healthcare operations, such as laboratory data collection for quality assurance. Healthcare workers must review and sign a confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement that describes the sensitivity of the patient's information. This signature verifies that the healthcare worker will Maintain the confidentiality of all patients' information, including laboratory tests that are being performed. They will keep the computer password from, for entering the laboratory patient's database secure from other people's knowledge, meaning once you obtain your password, you are not to pass your password around. If you're in the computer, you must log off when you are leaving said computer. So nobody else can have access to your password and username. You must maintain the confidentiality of patient's information when looking at the computer database of patient's medical record information. Some examples of serious, a seamlessly innocent actions that can lead to lawsuits can include Discussion of patient's information with a patient's family member without the patient's permission. Throwing laboratory test results into a regular trash can. Not logging off the computer after entering blood collection update. Sending a patient's laboratory test request to be printed and forgotten to take it off the printer. Forgetting to clear phone number from fax numbers, copiers, or etc. Patient confidentiality, which is negligent cases can arise out of violation of the most simple thing, the right to privacy or of the patient's confidentiality. Patients or employee laboratory test results must be considered strictly confidential. Negligence can be claimed, for example, if an employer's em employees or patient's drug abuse test results are released to anyone other than the attending physician 
or other authorized individuals. This is particularly true regarding employees or athlete drug or alcohol abuse screening and human immunodeficiency virus or HIV testing. Confidential materials include communication between the physician and the patient, the patient's verbal statements, medical computer entries on patients, and nonverbal communication such as laboratory test results. Confidentiality and HIV exposure. In some states, laws allow healthcare workers to know the identity of a patient who has AIDS or who has HIV, who or who is HIV positive. Many states, however, do not provide for the easy acquisition of this sensitive patient information. In the state of Louisiana, no, they don't necessarily tell us in so many words if a patient is HIV or AIDS positive, not in so many words. You might hear a nurse say, um, just be mindful or just be careful when you are attending this patient. They're not gonna come out and basically say, oh, be careful because this patient has AIDS or oh, be careful because this patient has hep C. They're necessarily not gonna say it. Now in the outpatient world, it's a little different than inpatient. Most patients will disclose and say, oh, please be careful on sticking because I have been tested positive for hep C. Or you'll see it on their orders when they come in for outpatient service that it has HIV or AIDS as the diagnosis code. So they don't really disclose it in a list per se of who is tested positive or not in the state of Louisiana. Who knows how it is in other states because I haven't been there. Uh, it is important to use the proper blood collection technique with safety precautions and require infection control procedures for homebound patients. If exposure to blood occurs through a needle stick, a lancet, or other means, the home health care worker needs to be certain of obtaining the patient's HIV status and other potential infectious disease such as hep C or hepatitis C to ensure that the proper immediate and long-term self-protective protocol steps can be taken. Standard of care. Standard of care is if a patient has suffered injury resulting from a blood collection for laboratory testing, the patient must show that the healthcare worker who collected the blood failed to meet the prevailing standard of care. All healthcare workers may conform to a specific standard of care to protect patients. The community has become a national community as a result of national laboratory standards and requirements. The standard of care is set by statutes, licensing requirements, rules and regulations of regulatory or professional organizations such as American Hospital Association, the Joint Commission, internal health care facilities, policies, procedures, rules and regulations, and professional publications. Make sure you read over the clinical alert. If you have the older book, it's on page 89. I'm not quite sure what it is in the newer book, but basically it talks about minors' rights as far as the next topic we're about to go into, which is informed consent when it comes to minors, adults, and patients who have HIV. So basically informed consent is a voluntary condition given by a patient to allow touching, examining, and our treatment by healthcare professionals, providers or professionals. Without, conform, without informed consent, intentional touching can be considered a criminal offense. So, in the healthcare environment, patients Patients must be informed of the possible consequences of having or not having particular medical treatment 
An informed consent form is then signed by the patient for approval of medical treatments, including blood collection itself. In the hospital, when the patient goes through the ER, they check themselves into the hospital, the RN usually obtains an informed consent saying, in order to treat you, to make you feel better, for you to go home, we are implying that we will perform these certain techniques and blase, blase, blase. The patient says, okay, he signs it, informed consent. Informed consent for research purposes. This is a fairly new thing that has come around as far as informed consent for research purposes. Due to unethical treatments of humans in the past for research purposes, the United States passed a law in 1974, which is called the National Research Act that established Institutional Research Board, IRBs, at institutions such as hospitals, universities that perform research. So basically, what this informed consent for research requires is a consent form that includes the following. It must have full disclosure of the research that is being conducted to the patient um, or family member if the patient is expired. It must describe the level of confidentiality of the research data. If at all possible, the patients should never be capable of being identified through the research study, meaning he cannot disclose his identification during this research procedure if the data is shared with other doctors. They must not disclose who the patient actually is. It must describe the measures that the researcher will take to ensure that the confidentiality is maintained at all times and that nothing will be breached. And basically this implied consent was brought about if you have ever heard, and it is a book also, it is called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lux. This was back in the 60s, I want to say. And of course, this bill came about in 1974 due to her family's uprising and decoration and a medical researcher who pretty much pushed the issue. So basically, if you watch The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lux, her sales that they obtained illegally called Gila X has cured more diseases than anything in the United States due to her cells being able to regenerate and to accumulate and be able to cure different diseases through her cells. Through her cells. Her cells have cured polio. It has cured somewhat of HIV. It has cured all kinds of diseases that didn't have an antidote or or a foreseeable cure to it. When we talk about implied consent, implied consent occurs when the patient, patient's nonverbal behavior indicates agreement. So if we go in a patient's room and we describe the, the procedure that we're doing and all they do is they just don't give you an arm, that is called an implied consent. They are giving you permission to draw their labs without verbally saying, okay, I give you permission to draw my labs. Um, implied consent is also due to emergency care. If a patient comes in unconscious, of course they cannot give you a verbal agreement to say, okay, provide me treatment so I can survive. That is kind of like a life and death situation. The requirement for implied consents differs legally from one state to another. Healthcare providers need to know the legal boundaries of implied consent because someday they may need to decide whether to perform a vital emergency procedure such as a cardiopulmonary resuscitation due to the fact that they are going into an MI or a myocardial infarction and their heart has ceased to work or it's about to cease to work.
Another legal thing that comes around is called statute of limitation. Basically, statutes and limitation is a law that defines how soon after an injury, for example, due to malpractice, a plaintiff must file the lawsuit or be forever banned from doing so. Most statutes of limitations are up to seven years. In some instances, they have up to seven years to file for a suit. That is the statute of limitation. The statute of limitation for professional negligence in most states is two years. <clears throat> is two years. Some states is one, two, three years. Just depends on the state. A complete and accurate medical record with laboratory test results is the best defense in these types of cases. In a malpractice suit, the first statement of a case by the plaintiff against the defendant is the complaint itself. It states a cause of action, notifying the uh, defendants of the reason for the lawsuit. There are several steps to follow to even begin a malpractice suit. The first thing that they must follow is they must have a discovery. A discovery simply means to examine the witnesses before the trial. Examination before the trial is a method used to enable the plaintiffs and defendants to learn more regarding the nature and substance of each case. And also, this discovery process consists of oral testimony under oath, under oath and includes cross-examination by each lawyer. A malpractice suit also has to have a deposition, which is a testimony of a witness that has been recorded in a written legal format. Either party in the lawsuit, plaintiff or defendant, may obtain a court order permitting examination and copying of laboratory results, incident reports from personal files, medical records, phlebotomy and laboratory policies and procedures, training manuals, and so forth, as well as other facts and information that may help in the discovery. You can also obtain a expert witness, which is an expert testimony, as well as the scientific or medical data is sometimes used, which is sometimes used to assist in establishing the standard of care required in any given situation. An expert witness may assist a plaintiff in providing the wrongful act of a defendant or may assist a defendant in reviewing any evidence such that the plaintiff have brought forth. Evidence during the trial is used to prove or disprove the lawsuit. Evidence must be complete, relevant, and important to the outcome of the case itself and it must follow within the Joint Commission standards as far as educational and training records for involved healthcare workers, board certification standards for healthcare workers, and laboratory policies and procedures. If you take a look at Table 3.1 in the textbook, it gives you law prevention tips for minimizing risk for you to have any malpractice. Respondent superior. Respondent superior, which is a Latin term meaning let the master answer, is a legal doctor that holds employers responsible for acts of their employees within the scope of the employment relationship. Not only may the injured party sue the employee directly, but The employer is sued as well. Um, Defermination is a compensation for financial loss suffered from the employee's act itself. Thanks. So, 
case related to clinical laboratory activities. Most phlebotomy cases are settled after a lawsuit is filed, but before the court renders a judgment itself. It is important to remember that many cases are not cited in the uh, literature because often healthcare institutions or healthcare workers negligent arbitration and they can settle out of court. Negotiate, I'm sorry, negligent. I have negligence on the brain. Healthcare workers, negotiation, arbitration, and they can sometimes settle out of court before it can get to a court case. Cases resulting from improper techniques and negligence. Healthcare workers who collect blood by venal function must be thoroughly trained and skilled in proper technique, safety, and the use of collection equipment. Problems that can arise or have led to phlebotomy lawsuits are listed here. Patient falling. If your patient feels dizzy or starts to feel dizzy, please don't make your patient get up because there's a waiting room full of patients. Make sure you sit down, make them sit down long enough to get their bearings and make sure that you give them orange juice, cookies, crackers, something to help raise their blood sugar levels so they don't feel faint and they won't fall down. Um, another thing is causing hematoma or hemorrhage from inadequate inadequate pressure to the vein. Now, as I stated before, hematoma sometimes can't be helped no matter if you do have the smallest needle in the world, especially on an elderly patient. Their skin is so thin that sometimes no matter how slow, how small, how delicate you do the venal puncture, it causes a hematoma. You just have to roll with the punches and be like that. But if you using this big barrel needle, a big, say, 18 gauge needle, and you know this patient has very thin, frail skin, and you use an 18 gauge needle anyway, and you cause a hematoma, well, that could be cause for a lawsuit because you you, you were negligent in your duty. Another thing is um, abscess or other infections after the venipuncture site. Some patients can uh, um, obtain abscess due to a venipuncture site due to the fact that you might have left the tourniquet on too long and had caused the patient to have um, an abscess. Injuries from fainting before, during, or after blood collection. Like I said, you just have to be mindful of your patient. Be aware of what's happening to your patient. That is the main thing you want to be always aware of. What is going on with your patient after you draw the blood? If they feel woozy, nauseous, they feel like their head is bobbing back and forth and they're about to pass out, don't make that patient leave. Make sure you take care of your patient before leaving, before you let them leave. Um, let's see, injury from no, nerve damage due to poor venipuncture technique. Um, that's why we practice so much on telling the difference between a vein and a tendon and a nerve. A tendon feels cordy, a vein feels bouncy like a little basketball, very spongy. Sponge Bobby. Um, complications from collecting blood from the same site as a mastectomy, removal of the breast. Never, ever, never, never, never draw on the same size of a patient who has had a mastectomy. The only exception to that rule is if the lymph nodes hadn't been removed and the mastectomy is greater than 10 or more years older then we can draw on that side and that's only if the patient has doctor clearance from her doctor to draw on the same side as her mastectomy other than that we draw on the opposite side now i know somebody is going to have a question and is in the back of their mind what if they have a double mastectomy what happens now if they had it at the same time and it's less than 10 years old 
then most nine out of 10 times that patient has some type of metaport imported. So we probably will never see those types of patients because they have a metaport because only RNs can draw from those lines because you have to do a heparin push along with that. And as for bottomless, we cannot handle narcotics. Heparin is considered a narcotic because we don't have a license to handle narcotics. If they have a double mastectomy and it's greater than 10 years and they still have their lymph nodes, we can draw from the patient. If not, like I said, we won't see that patient, not out of cannot, due to the fact that they have a metaport inserted into them. <coughs> Excuse me. Complications in blood collection from obese patients. This is one of those taboo things. Not all obese patients have bad veins. Hindsight. Um, even your most smallest skinny person who has hardly any fat on their body at all can have complications as far as blood collection. So um, complications from blood collection from an obese person basically just simply says that sometimes you would have to do a blind stick or you would have to do is grab a longer needle in order to go deeper within the arm. Um, wristband or identification errors, that is a gimme being that we are the first man in other than the doctor. The doctor may assess the patient, the nurse may do her assessments such as blood pressure, pulse rate, respiratory, yada, 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 get information about the patient, what medicines the patient is currently on. That is the nurse's duty. Our duty is when we go in there, we have to follow our two identifier rules. We have to either get a verbal and look at their wristband, or we look at their wristband and we look at their ID. If they have one, if they're in-house, we usually do that. If they don't have a wristband, we ask the charge nurse that's in charge of the patient to come in to verify said patient so we can make sure that we have the correct patient. And once she verbally verifies, you do a reback and say, well, this is Mr. Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T, Landry, L-A-N-D-R-Y. And you spell out the name to make sure that that's exactly how they spell it because they might not spell it that way. You know, I don't know how you would change the spelling of Robert Landry, but okay. Um, examples of some past lawsuits that phlebotomists have encountered. Um, venal punctures performed without proper training, meaning Back in the day, before you had to acquire certification, and this day and age too, because some employers will hire for bottomers without their certification, they just give them 90 days to obtain it. And once their 90 days have expired and they still haven't retained, but they haven't maintained or acquired their certification, they are let go. But what happens in the meantime? if they perform something improper. That'll be some cause of a phlebotomy lawsuit. Failure to take precautions to avoid patient sensco, basically just letting the patient fall down and just fall down and not taking care of them after they have fainted. That's basically what it's saying. Uh, patient death caused by misread Glucometer resulting in them getting an extra dose of insulin. So when we're doing insulin checks, we have to make sure that that machine is not only calibrated correctly, but that it is functioned correctly. Uh, improper blood collection resulting in nerves damage to patients. There are good It implies, there again, it implies to the situation of make sure you stick in a vein and not a tendon or, or no, uh, not a tendon nerve. HIV related issues. 
If a healthcare worker becomes infected with HIV during employment at a healthcare facility, worker compensation benefits are usually available for said workers. This casual connection includes having a document incident report at the healthcare facility involving a needle stick injury, a puncture wound, or other exposure to HIV contaminated blood or body fluid. Uh, Pre-employment health evaluations may prove useful later should the healthcare worker responsible for monitoring post-exposure follow-up. If a healthcare worker resigns because of contracting AIDS, unemployment benefits may be available if the worker can show that he or she believed in good faith that continued employment would jeopardize his or her health. Professional liability insurance. The thing to remember with professional liability insurance is that the healthcare worker who routinely deals with public and uh, patient healthcare worker relationship is indeed liable for anything. Um, some professional organizations offer professional liability insurance at a reasonable or a reduced rate. A record of continuing education courses, seminar worksheets, performance evaluation, or uh, academic credits should be a part of the healthcare worker's personal file at all times. That's why it's very important to make sure you Continue your EDs, your CEs after you obtain your phlebotomy or both EKG and phlebotomy certification. So therefore you won't, you don't lose it and you always use it. All right, clinical laboratory regulation. The federal government has issued agencies that regulate and oversee all clinical laboratories. These include the U.S. FDA, our Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Medicare or Medicaid Services, or CMS, and the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, as is known, and the Department of Transportation, the DOT. I know you're saying, what does the Department of Education Department of Transportation have anything to do with what we do is because we transport. If we work outpatient, we're transporting labs in our car, our company car, to the lab to get tested. So that's why we have the Department of Transportation involved in what we do. Um, let's see. The CMS regulates all clinical laboratories through the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Administration of 1988, which is what we call CLIA of 1988, which are periodically revised. Regulations apply to any site that tests human specimens, whether the tests are simple to perform, are technical, technically complicated, and they include all test sites from small physician office to large hospital laboratories. Phlebotomists should be knowledgeable about the licensure required when applicable because they may be allowed to perform certain procedures in one state but not in another state themselves. Make sure you go over um, the different types of tests that the different complexities of tests when you go through box um, three, four. About wave tests, test of moderate complexity, and test of high complexity. So this concludes, sorry, this concludes chapter, chapter three's lecture. I hope everything was 
Um, I wish to bid you a good day. And if you have any questions or you need any answers, please text or email me at any time. Thank you and have a nice day. Bye-bye.